Well, good morning and good evening. It's great to have you join us for today's second panel in our fall semester series on the transformation of and challenges to the American-led liberal international order. I'm Mark Frazier, co-director of the India-China Institute, and it's my honor and pleasure to moderate today's panel. In recent decades, the liberal international order has been fundamentally destabilized by the rise of emerging powers across the global south and a process largely spearheaded, but not exclusively so, by China, um, and also by uh, formations such as the, the BRICS, uh, whose summit in Johannesburg in August drew a great deal of media attention and scholarly attention about discussions of a possible uh, alternative world order. Well, whatever one labels it, this post-liberal world brings substantial risks as well as potentially new channels to address contemporary crises in climate, environment, migration, capitalism, and as we all know, in public health. This semester, the purpose of the panels is to ask how new arrangements will be forged in a world that straddles the power and influence of China, India, and other emerging powers together with the leaders of the current liberal order, including the United States and Europe. Well, many of you joined us on September 21st for our first panel, which was titled Changing Regimes, Changing World Orders, question mark, which offered trans-regional perspectives from Africa and Asia. And we encourage you to join us on November 2nd for the third panel titled Transforming Global Governance Institutions in a Shifting World Order. All of this information about panels past and present and future can be found on the India China Institute website. Today's panel on new frameworks for food security is co-sponsored with NYU Abu Dhabi and the Environmental Humanities Research Initiative based at NYU Abu Dhabi. So the aims of food security were at one time focused largely on hunger eradication, food distribution, safety nets in times of emergencies such as famine or flooding, but in the 21st century, uh, added to those older concerns, we now have debates over food, food security that converge with climate change, biotechnology, of course, the old one of geopolitics, uh, as well as uh, maybe under-remarked or under-reported political economy that contends with the dominance of a vast number of maybe what we could call agri-industrial corporations with global reach and global land holdings as well. This new landscape demands frameworks that contend with multiple scales, of course, from the global to the local, and that frameworks that integrate uh, environmental, animal, and human health, and that bring food security into conversations, of course, with climate change and consequences of climate change, which I, I believe we'll be discussing uh, in some detail today. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that Russia's war on Ukraine has had a very direct impact on food supplies and prices, particularly of grain, uh, given the, the, the breadbasket of the globe, as some people have called uh, Ukraine. Uh, and also the war has caused, uh, had consequences for debt and inflation worldwide, especially among the poorest countries. So today we will hear about these new frameworks for food security from a panel of experts, uh, who, some of whom are based here in the East Coast of the United States, but whose, whose home institutions are in China, India, and the Middle East. Each panelist will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by your questions. So I invite you to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will pose them to the panelists as they, uh, at the conclusion of their presentations. So first we will hear, and I'll offer a, a, a quick introduction to each of our three speakers uh, before turning the floor over to them. First, we will hear from Professor Jia Daljong, who is a professor of international political economy in the School of International Studies at Peking University, where he also directs uh, two important centers, one on the center called the Center on Transnational Issues, and one uh, uh, at Peking University's Ocean Research Institute. He specializes in non-traditional security issues in China's foreign relations, with a particular focus on energy, food, and transboundary water issues. This year, Professor Jia is a visiting scholar at the Paul Tsai Center at Yale, from where he joins us today. Second, we will hear from Professor Sofia Kalantzikos, who is Distinguished 
a global distinguished professor in environmental studies and public policy at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Her research focuses on natural resources and power and on new emergent patterns and avenues of reimagining global politics for the 21st century. She is the author of, among several other works, China and the Geopolitics of Rare Earths, published in 2018, and uh, the EU, US, and China Tackling Climate Change, Policies and Alliances for the Anthropocene. She founded and heads the Environmental Humanities Research Initiative at NYU Abu Dhabi, who, as I said earlier, is a co-sponsor of today's event. And in the summer of 2020, she launched a new project, the Geopolitics and Ecology of Him Him Himalayan Water, which addresses growing water insecurity. So I, I could imagine we, we might have food and water uh, security being discussed today, given the respective expertise of Professor Kalansikos and Professor Ja. Third, who will be joining us uh, later on in, in the panel, you may not see his, uh, his uh, image uh, until later on, uh, because uh, he's been called into, as he frequently is, uh, uh, a, a meeting with uh, the government of India this morning. Uh, Aramar Revi is the director of the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore and is a globally recognized expert in sustainable development. He's the co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and has led the global campaign, especially for urban sustainable development putting urban sustainable development as part of the UN's uh, 2030 development agenda. He's one of the world's leading experts on global environmental change, especially climate change. And as I, I alluded to earlier and what's causing him to join us a little bit later, he's a senior advisor to several ministries in the government of India and also consults frequently with international development institutions, national and transnational firms on economic, environmental, social change and with that all said, uh, I will now turn it over to Professor Ja for his remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's almost uh, hmm, 10 years ago when I was uh, uh, at the new school. I say uh, thank you for inviting me to join the discussion today. In the interest of time, I will... Uh, huh, doesn't have the... I have a few hard points, but oh, here it is. Sorry, um, I just go through a few bullet points I prepared for this occasion, and uh, so that it gives me some coherence in what I'm going to say. Well, the food security, as it said in the program description, is a time-honored subject. Um, the word food security. Insecurity is quite uh, serious. Um, I referred to some latest publications, for instance, uh, uh, the World Bank and other sources report that some 48 countries, there are 238 million people are still suffering from nutrition insecurity. And worse still, as of last year, according to the FAO's estimates, the progress in terms of food supply and nutrition since 2015 were um, erased. And this is a uh, very disheartening, partly with the pandemic, partly with policy. And the severe food insecurity affects 11% of the total population. And then certainly you, we have the war uh, in Ukraine that's uh, now more than one year and a half and um, the food shipments I believe later on in the discussion, we'll get to that. But more relatedly, Russia and Belarus uh, account for some 20% of fertilizer supply and the war is disruption, although that disruption dated uh, back before the war officially started. And many countries have uh, instituted uh, food restrictions, uh, export restrictions uh, since 2020. And, uh, I do see records of China restricting um, export of cornstarch, uh, one item um, that's expected to expire by the end of this year. But then what are the causes? <clears throat> we as academics are better analyzing the large picture issues. Um, some are quite always mentioned, supply chains have been disrupted, not necessarily because total 
of growth is uh, sharply dropped down. Uh, although you do have climate change induced uh, extreme weathers, but then um, as always Mark in the uh, introduction mentioned that you have the large food companies dominating, you also have the financialization of food trade. But there are some less discussed um, issues, I would think. Uh, there is indeed that issue of who gets to feed the world and for what reason. Uh, that's part of this. It's, we have, we are in some sort of a paradox. On the one hand, countries that are more capable are often called upon, especially at you know multilateral agencies, to step forward and commit more resources. But on the other hand, uh, for those countries, or at least look, some segment of the government officials, especially those in diplomacy, they would see one party doing more as a source of competition, and that would not, they would not necessarily be supporting that. So the now then a second thing, uh, issue that's less discussed, but I wouldn't think it's a particular, peculiarly Chinese concern. It's about biotechnology. Biotechnology is a huge basket, but uh, there is agricultural biotechnology uh, should it be developed. And the development involves many sensitive issue, issues such as uh, AI, application, competition, and then there are other areas of technology, including digital technologies, and how about also the deployment of uh, agricultural technology. De you know, that's a source of competition as well, that you would have food surplus issues in some more capable countries. And on the receiving end, uh, globally, I would say, the notion of food sovereignty uh, is on the rise as well. And then, um, what about China's approaches to world food security? There are a lot of writings about it, and uh, Chinese government officials, agencies, scholars make a lot of effort to project that. Uh, this is me, a political scientist, um, quick reading. For China, food security is a core emphasis in you know, the notion of a holistic approach to security, especially since 2000. Uh, the notion was tabled in 2013, and so far it has been steadfastly kept uh, tight in um, the Chinese government uh, budgeting and uh, arrangement of uh, administrative resources. So in other words, uh, China is committed to having an overall of government approach to ensuring self-sufficiency for the own, mostly in stable food supply. I wouldn't think China is capable of ensuring total uh, self-sufficiency in food and food products. That's not feasible and uh, it's unwise, I would think, but staple food. Um, uh, the, the difference, as I observe, is that uh, in terms of self-help, self the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, in many other countries, especially in the industrialized countries, the SDG is a sort of afterthought, is more a uh, accounting uh, one of the methods of accounting progress. But in China, SD is actually treated as a guidance for implementation. If you look at Chinese language uh, expression, it's a law shi. In other words, we use that as the benchmark in planning policies rather than just something for statistical review. So you can say that's to make use of the international um, source of wisdom, should we say, to plan domestic policies. But then 2021, September, um, China which moved forward with a global development initiative of the eight priority areas, food security uh, was one of them. And uh, it's this initiative is more than just the initiative. Uh, the major action since then is in spite of the ongoing COVID pandemic, China worked to facilitate imports of agricultural produce under the FOCAC 
that's newer, the China Africa Cooperation Forum, and then especially with uh, the Chinese FTAs, when you look at China and many uh, a number of Latin American and Caribbean states, uh, the food trade is a um, clear item. In other words, to facilitate trade import, and this is not to say the continuation of preferential policies for importing food uh, products, fruits, uh, with the vegetable and others from Southeast Asia. China is a strong supporter of the multilateral efforts, including FAO. Uh, Actually, uh, one of my students in the audience today, she's a bit more knowledgeable than I am on um, this. I, I thank her for helping me find some of the references. Um, in 2009, China and the FAO set up a South-South Cooperation Trust Fund. And thus far, $130 million has been contributed to that. And uh, a strong focus is agricultural technology demonstration centers uh, across Africa and also in Asia as well. Uh, in addition to that, that's what one of the programs we have at Peking University is on policy exchange. We bring in students um, who are mid career government officials from uh, the global south to exchange knowledge and the policy with their peers from the Chinese government, including the Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, and other ministries. But then we have some challenges here. One is, as I mentioned before, you have big power competition that happens in the area of food aid or food relief. Indeed, there is donor competition, and that sometimes it's not always straightforward humanitarian. Um, and secondly, uh, the investment in capacity enhancement in, in a low or, or middle income country, especially low income country, you do have that matching capacity and how to embed this assistance project in a local uh, business ecosystem. Now, this particular past summer, my school actually dispatched a team. This is a renewal of past efforts to Africa, uh, to Ethiopia, Tanzania, to look at um, how these centers can be done, that these uh, demonstration centers can be improved. The third is that the multilateral uh, organizations, many in China may think the greater level of contribution, the better, but that may not be true. Uh, when the number of Chinese staffers in FAO is larger than that in the UN headquarters, if you look at uh, uh, some of the studies by the US Congress, they see that, oh my goodness, they see that as a um, loss for the United States or by extension, a, uh, a, a issue area to compete against China with. And last but not least, uh, there are interests here. I'm not uh, a believer in these. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that China is doing this just because it has um, no self-interest. There are interests, but the interest here is the technical standards. That's another area of competition. And then along with adoption of a standard that's initiated by one party, you have commercial interests. So there's a long way to go. But then still between uh, China and those countries that receive assistance for knowledge exchange, what is the right way, right? The Chinese emphasis is on this idea, small is beautiful. Our emphasis is on food availability. Let's do it, get the project down, bring more food to the table. But then, um, you know, for international development agencies, the research efforts and uh, from other, especially OECD countries, or for that matter, let me put it this way, European and North American countries, they would try to have, um, uh, they would prefer to see systematic change on the part of the recipients. So this comes to the last slide. Can we have a new paradigm? I would say some of the realities remain quite stubborn. You have, indeed, no matter how hard you try, agriculture has to deal with land and the climate uh, endowments. Then you have demographic 
realities and trends, especially in the uh, chronic uh, the food import dependent countries um, in Africa and West Asia. Um, every, every country raises is a sort of on the ladder to urbanize and industrialize. That does take stage. And the commercialization of agriculture is also uh, controversial. But then somehow, I don't know if my assessment is correct, the weaponization of food trade, um, at least I think it's more of, it's now treated as a moral hazard or it's actually becoming more of a norm because uh the ideas of dependence influence and other geographic or uh, geological uh, political concerns so actually one of the things i <clears throat> encounter a lot in conversations with my uh, chinese colleagues who don't study international relations who work in finance in agriculture or the who participate in the g20 discussion in agriculture they don't quite get these ideas what do you mean dependence what do you mean influence just increase the food production. That's there. Or if it needs fertilizer, get a fertilizer. If it needs um, technicians, get their technicians. So do you have a gap in carrying out these sort of conversations? But I would really think the word, if we, one way to build toward the paradigm is to return to idea of the function, functionalism that worked very well, especially in the 50s and 60s. We had far more diverse sets of uh, nation states around the world, but under the UN, a lot of projects got out of ground. Uh, but the question is whether or not that can be applied to big power interactions, including between China and uh, other countries. Uh, earlier, Mark mentioned, uh, you know, a seeming polarization between Ukraine and the BRICS. And last but not least, I would think, uh, the, the experience in Asia, you know, it's quite diverse. If you look at the ASEAN plus three, that's China, Japan, and South Korea, they had a very meaningful uh, regional rice emergency reserve arrangement that has thus far you know, worked quite well in terms of uh, hedging against policy intervention, should we say, uh, against financial speculation of regional food trade. So let me stop here and thank you very much. I look forward to the uh, Sophia's presentation and later on the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jha and Sophia. You're ready? I am. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Mark, uh, for putting this together in the New School in the India China Institute. And uh, NYU Abu Dhabi is very happy to collaborate with you. We have so many uh, interests, uh, intersecting interests in, in talking about, you know, a, another part of the world that if you're in Europe or North America, we kind of forget that so much uh, attention and uh, action and developments have shifted. So it, it's always great to turn the globe around and look at where, you know, look at this, look at where things are truly um, evolving and in areas where we need to have completely new conversations. So uh, Professor Jha, I think he he said it out really, really nicely. Uh, it's obvious that, you know, we've kind of solved the um, decarbonization issue. I mean, we've all embarked on uh, the decarbonization and the digitalization of the global economy in the name of the climate crisis. I always want to remind people that it's really not supposedly not about wanting to sell electric cars and electrifying transport. It's really about uh, solving the climate problem, reducing emissions. And transport has been responsible for 30% of emissions. For the longest time, there's been so much pushback against, um, against this until we managed to kind of break the code of how to make money off of it. And now decarbonization is the great big global industrial plan, the post, the uh, essence, I would almost say, the main focus of the uh, post-COVID recovery. Uh, of course, as we're discovering every industrial plan that we have, considering it's an industrial plan and it's very labor and material intensive, has other environmental repercussions, 
we don't have enough, uh, who's going to be first, who's going to be second. And this all brings in these issues of contention and competition, and which are accelerating in the global order. So um, there is no doubt that geopolitics are completely contentious right now and are getting uh, more and more contentious, unfortunately, because the climate crisis really requires us to have more cooperation and collaboration rather than this kind of hyper competition. So I feel as if the world order is gratuitously almost failing to find a way to reduce the level of hyper competition in order to really focus on what it is to, uh, for us to find ways to reduce the impacts of the climate crisis. And I, I start by saying this because that we've seen in the last summer and even now in the fall alone that things are accelerating. And there is this false belief in politics that you can be competitive in every other sector, but somehow solve a, go a global plot problem together. And that brings us to what Professor Jha was saying, the weaponization of interdependence. I mean, for the longest time, we've been building these global chains, supply chains, uh, financial chains, connections across the world through the uh, free trade and uh, the World Trade Organization. These are ways by which we've, we've rationalized these kinds of connections in order to truly uh, allow for all of the countries in the world to grow and bring a uh, higher quality of living and modernization uh, from one side of the globe to the other. So I think what's happening now is in the time when we need to really be strengthening at least the ties of interdependence, we can talk about the, the way that global trade is developed, that's a whole other conversation, but we are weaponizing all of these relationships. And this has happened surely with the decarbonization of the global economy, as we see with the fight over critical minerals and AI and various components for the digitalization of the global economy. And now we're turning our attention to food because while transport was responsible for 30% of global emissions, food is also, food systems are also responsible for 26 to 30% of global emissions. Now, of course, there's always the question of why are we viewing what's happening on the planet only in terms of, of reducing emissions? Again, this is a whole other conversation. I think we need a much more holistic approach. However, going back to food security, after, I guess, I mean, food has always been an important issue. It's been part of the SDG goals. All countries in the world are concerned about food. This is why it's been so difficult to find ways to reach any kind of real global agreement about uh, reducing the subsidies for uh, farmers and for the ag tech industry na on nationally, because there, all countries are very concerned about how they will feed their citizens. And there's always been this concern. I mean, the EU common agricultural policy is a product of this incredible anxiety and concern over being not self-sufficient. I mean, I agree with Professor Dodd. This is not, it's not on the table to be entirely autonomous and um, independent from you know, global supply chains. But the reality is that food is at the center of everything because food is life. Now we've entered, uh, but, but you know, it was overshadowed by other concerns, which was, as I said, the decarbonization of the global economy. So now we're turning to food and I think part of it has been triggered by COVID the disruption of supply chains. In terms of Africa, there was also the locusts that were also the intensity of the locust uh, phenomenon in the past few years was accelerated by the climate crisis. More rains in the desert, more locusts uh, were born, uh, completely decimated parts of, uh, of East Africa and creating tremendous humanitarian emergencies. But we're also seeing that um, th that it's really hard to have, let's say, a universal plan on how to deal with food systems 
because it needed to find a way to become monetized. Only about 2% of green financing, if I'm not mistaken, is going toward uh, ag- greening of the agricultural sector. Now, food systems are not just the agricultural sector, I might add, uh, but this is a very uh, a very big part of it. Now, I you know I just want to bring in the UAE here as an interesting case study. Uh, be- first of all, the UAE is hosting COP28, which is taking place this December, and already during Climate Week. The presidency of COP uh, made has called for the parties to sign a declaration on resilient food systems, sustainable agriculture, and climate action. So the UAE, a country that is very vulnerable to shortages of food, it's a very arid country, very little agriculture can take place there. It faces tremendous water scarcity. It's part of a a region that faces similar problems, whether we look at MENA or East Africa. And there's a tremendous anxiety. It it began earlier uh, how to bolster food security within the country. And and part of, of, of this attention that the UAE has placed on food security is interesting because it be, all began, I would say, I mean, it's always been a concern, but in 2017, when there was a break in relations with Qatar, it became obvious that overnight things could really change and there was no I don't know, shelf life in the food supply system. There wasn't enough water in case there was some kind of disruption in the supply chains. And the government of the UAE turned its attention, created a ministry for food security and water in 2017, and um, began uh, developing a food security plan. And that really made a tremendous difference because the UAE started to look at how it could make ensure that it had water resources, how it would make sure that it had, it could cultivate food within uh, the country, which also led to this interest and investment in food technologies and ag business, and also relations with countries like China or South Korea that were working on all of these new uh, technologies to, for uh, developing uh, climate resilient crops. So gradually what happened is, I think that the UAE saw in food security, it was very, I guess it was very experimental and almost forward thinking. It started to see that food security could become an area in which the UAE could now, uh, using its economic diplomacy and its growing relations with a region that it now re-envisions as part of its own neighborhood, which is MENA, East Africa, but India as well, opening this opening up to the Indian Ocean, could become an area in which it could truly excel and could really respond to an issue that everybody cares about, which is the question of uh, uninterrupted access to food. And the uh, in, in especially in light of the climate crisis and other external shocks, like the war in Ukraine was one of these external shocks. The uh, COVID disruption of supply chains, another one of these external shocks. The contentious ge- geopolitics, another huge external uh, shock that could affect this region. So re- I just wanna remind everyone that the UAE is a, one of the largest fossil fuel producers and it, but it but turning its attention to food security, which also, as I said before, was responsible for about 26 to 30 percent of global emissions, the food sector and food systems in general. I think it also gave the UAE the opportunity to really demonstrate climate leadership. And as you'll see in COP28, there is going to be a lot of emphasis both on food and water. And these are areas in which the UAE will take very strong uh, initiatives. Now. This, I will. I want to add a few more things about this because I do believe that it's it's particularly important. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the geopolitics, but also of these different ways that we envision 
uh, food security. So Professor Jha told us about China's view and basically some of the dilemmas that are out there politically, but also in terms of defining food security nationally and some of the issues that are coming up. And these are great frames by which to think about things. But I'll say that what I find particularly interesting with the UAE is that it's placed its emphasis on viewing the food security as an infrastructure problem as well as an ag tech issue. And I think Professor Jha said that there's a lot of competition there in terms of the ag tech, because that is a place where there's intellectual property. And, and the question that he, he, he raised, and I think is fantastic, is who is going to feed the world and for what reason? That is a really loaded question and a very interesting question that we need to consider. So the UAE found ways to uh, speak to its strength. And it used Dubai ports, for example. It's one of the largest um, uh, companies in uh, managing ports across the world. So it invested a lot in infrastructure for, for preservation of foods. And it, in order to, and it sought ways to uh, become sort of the the hub for the transfer transport of food, but it also so it's it spoke to its its own strengths in finding ways to I want to say monetize and make build by seeing seeing this as an infrastructure issue. It is also invested very heavily in finding in new technologies for food. It has created the largest vertical indoor vertical farm, for example. So these are new technological solutions. It's investing in uh, the production and the development, the research and development of seeds that are uh, resilient, as we said, in very arid or um, uh, climates or where water is heavily uh, uh, sal salinated. So these are really important, but it's also investing in space tech for food because, you know, we 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 tend to like ignore, but, you know, the space economy has positioned itself today to become part of the global response to the climate crisis. And I would say that's another whole interesting conversation uh, and, and an area of tremendous competition of how the space economy has now become part of the climate solution. Now, going back to food, I think one of the things that we need to think about is when we talk about food security, what do we mean in the, what, what does food security look like in the Anthropocene? And what is it that we really want to achieve? Some of the questions we may want to ask is, how is it that industrial agriculture that has been the source of the problem of all of these, the degradation, the pollution, the uh, impoverishment of the soil, how is industrial agriculture being reframed to become part of the solution? Because maybe, because we're not moving away from that. We're still talking about technology and industrial plans. Vertical farm is also an industry. It means intensive, cultivation of very specific and few, I might add, crops in completely different conditions. I mean, if you walk in there, it does look like a warehouse or a factory. So industrial agriculture that was being very heavily criticized prior to COVID with, you know, food is a very contentious political issue to begin with. How is it now that we've we talk a little bit about regenerative farming. And in fact, it's interesting uh, that that in during Climate Week, as I said before, the UAE presidency wants people, uh, parties to sign the Declaration on Resilient Food Systems and Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Action. But it's also talking a lot about uh, regenerative farming practices. But the reality is that a lot of these solutions that are being uh, advertised or promoted or prioritized, I think is the better word, are really very tech and industry scale driven. So that is a very big question uh, we need to ask. Uh, one, a few more thoughts. Going back to 
this idea of becoming a climate leader uh, by really emphasizing food security, what does that really entail? And what are the geopolitical repercussions of that? So interestingly enough, we see that the UAE and the US at COP26, they came up with an initiative called AIM, AIM, uh, AIM for Climate, where they're, they're uh, financing climate smart solutions in different countries around the world. There's also the new form formation of the I2U2, which is India, Israel, the US and the UAE. It's a new regional alliance that focuses on different areas, among which are energy, food security, food security, water and space. And this alliance is very, very new in 2022, and it's placing tremendous emphasis on food security. And that, and we see that these particular countries are having a new sort of regional reconfiguration, are contributing to a regional power reconfiguration. The reality is that even though the hyper competition is centering around US China competition, and I would say that the US is really pushing hard for this bipolar world, which most of the rest of the countries in the world do not really want to see uh, come to being ever again. The reality is that we are living in a much more multipolar world. There are more actors that either have money or influence or an appetite for um, regional leadership. And the UAE has demonstrated some of these uh, aspects and facets and how this is really changing regional um, geopolitics in an area that is also an area of, of contention. But this opening up to MENA, East Africa, and bringing in the Indian Ocean and with India as an important pillar of this collaboration is something that we shouldn't uh, overlook. And specifically, it, with respect to food security, the UAE committed substantial funding to various um, uh, technologies and green parks across India to develop new kinds of, uh, of food technologies. So I don't want to go over in time, uh, Mark really indicate, but I, I want to say that, you know, we, we have a lot to work with and a lot to think about. Certainly, there's geopolitical competition about who will be helping countries that are facing food shortages and food and food issues? How do we conceive of what is agriculture and foods? What does agriculture look like in the climate crisis era? How much food do we want to produce? You know, we're going back to the same additive logic that we have to our energy systems. Uh, and I think Professor Ja mentioned that when certain, you know, when he talks to colleagues, it's all about, well, we need more food. So the question is, it's always about quantity. There's this, the, the equation that we're trying to solve is really dictating the policy, policy outcomes. If we keep saying we need more food, then we need to intensify food production under any circumstances. That means then the logic goes, we need more industrial food production to feed more people. If we go, if we ask the questions a little bit differently, how do we truly find ways to produce the kinds of foods that what we need to, to feed the population well and in a diverse fashion? Because these technologies are also reducing the variety of food that's being produced globally then I think we're trying to solve for a very, uh, a very different kind of equation. And lastly, I would say that a lot of this that we call food production is actually food for animals. And that we forget. When we talk about corn shortages or other kinds of, of, of shortages, which are meant to be food for the, the uh, increasingly, the exploding, I would say, uh, desire to, to produce more and more meat, then this is not food to feed people. It's indirectly uh, to feed animals, to feed people in a particular way. 
that may or may not even be aligned with cultural preferences. So I threw it all out there on the table. I'm looking forward to a robust conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia and Professor Ja. Those were really just incredibly enlightening remarks, uh, lots of, of big picture frameworks, conceptual uh, analysis, as well as uh, you know, a lot of just in, enlightening details that uh, one does not hear about. Uh, and I consider myself an avid consumer of journals and policy journals and news and, and reports and things like this. Um, and, and even the I2U2 is, is quite a, a fascinating uh, alignment. Um, and I'm really glad you at, at the end there, Sophia. You you talked about um, the food production being, uh, you know, we, we we don't recognize the extent to which it's produced for animals, and this reflects the global uh, dietary shifts. And then, of course, we talk about trade in livestock, which which can be um, oh, yeah. also, uh, you know, quite um, uh, sometimes weaponized, sometimes um, you know, regulated for very uh, important reasons. But we do have some questions, and and for those of you in the audience, where we are hoping, and we still expect that Professor uh, Revy will join us uh, after his meeting, um, and we will now, however, turn to to your questions from the audience. So again, I remind you to put your questions in the Q and A box, and, and I will convey them to the panelists. Um, and and after Professor Revy gives his remarks, we'll have a chance to to ask a second round of questions. But um, I want to recognize a question that's come in to me from my colleague, Manjri Mahajan, um, to the panelists. And uh, one of the questions is about the language of competition um, that has permeated food uh, security discussion uh, in both presentations. Um, it is an old anxiety, food security. And in the past, this anxiety was expressed in uh, largely humanitarian terms, uh, in political terms for domestic stability, now, however, the language around food security is animated uh, by terms of competition and contention uh, and weaponization, as you both said in your remarks. How does this shift in discourse to competition shape older international institutions like the FAO? Um, how does it shape even um, for, for Professor Jia, I suppose, how does it shape uh, domestic politics in China? So uh, we'll start there. Um, we'll we'll ha hear from both of you, and then I, I believe we can turn it over to Professor Revy, who, who's just joined. So uh, we'll, we'll bite off on that question and then go to uh, Professor Revy. Okay, well, I'll give it a try. Um, again, I must emphasize I'm a, an observer of Chinese politics on food security and also uh, food in Chinese, Chinese foreign relations. Um, a number of years back, uh, under the auspices of the, internet, uh, the Chatham House, uh, there was uh, a dialogue in uh, Bahrain that was on um, food security in the Middle East. And I actually was asked to write a paper in preparation for that, I did. I searched really hard, and it was a very typically Chinese way of thinking. What can China do to kind of enhance food security in the MENA region? Oh, okay. I thought it made sense, but it didn't really ring much of a bell. I asked, I proposed that, uh, you know, Middle Eastern countries invest in the food harvest loss management in China. Okay. The theory being, Fine, you have growth, you have transportation bot net, networks, the uh, bottlenecks, you also have financial uh, issues within China. Should the Middle East come in and, uh, let's say, build more silos, and you can have offtake arrangements for those silos earmarked for export to the Middle East that wouldn't really have a disruption of uh, food supply in China. I thought I had it all mapped out. But um, um, yeah, it attracted some discussions because it was more a, uh, most of the audience for policy. But today it's very interesting to hear about the uh, I2U2 or the uh, UAE and others heavy investment in agro technologies or production in the desert and other um, what's normally consider considered adverse situations. I would qualify the, you know, the uh, UAE approach or the 
I2U2 approach as a competition. The competition is not always negative. It, I, I think it's context specific. But then it becomes a little bit concerning when, you know, um, projects, especially in times of emergency relief, are needed. Um, that normally should be done, like the World Food Program. Uh, we mentioned the questioner asked about FAO, but there is another one that's the World Food Program. And over there, you have competition among the donors. You also have a competition uh, on the part of the recipients for the donors. There are lots of issues are in here. So a lot of times, it's not really about food. It's about in, what's called influence or the added value. Now, domestic policies in China, um, this is very obvious, even though today's topic, we're focusing on more on the global south, I would suppose. Um, yeah, China does import soybean or bread, corn, and other types of products. But then um, in more recent years, that competition has, has led to Chinese companies being asked to choose between um, Brazil, Argentina, or and the North America, Canada, and the United States. It's part of the uh, geopolitical uncertainty. At the end of the day, I would think, let me, at least in my summary, I'm going to end now. The, yeah, the Im impetus for competition is always there. It can be done on anything. But in the end, uh, each and every country or government, especially the more capable ones of the world, will have to find a balance between pursuit of what it, de uh, it defines as security and the market realities that demand efficiency. Let me stop here. Thank you. Can I add? Uh, you. Yes, please, Professor Kalanskas. So I just wanted to say that the I2U2, yes, is definitely a uh, a political, maybe even a geopolitical power move to uh, re-envision the region, but so is the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, across the Belt and Road Initiative that China has embarked on and has become its signature uh, global initiative, there we started with belt and belts and roads that were energy belts and roads and trade belt and roads, but now we have, you know, food. Uh, related belt and roads, farm belt and roads. So there's been this idea of of creating a sort of a, a, a chain of countries with which China can also collaborate with either for technological food agri tech ag tech exchange or in terms of other sources of import as the geopolitical landscape becomes more contentious and they need to substitute uh, the import, let's say of soybeans from one place from the US to another. So I do think that there's, because we're in this global world and because the geopolitics are becoming contentious, I will absolutely agree. Everything can be weaponized uh, today. And I think, the, the, it all started and revolved around what nobody cared about previously, which are supply chains. Now, supply chains, which used to be the most boring topic on, on earth and nobody really wanted to deal with, have come to be the epicenter of geopolitical competition because they are sort of the avenues by which we move resources around. And we're seeing resource competition uh, rearing its head on multiple levels. And in an interconnected world, these kinds of global supply chains, which I might add, are not in, in many industries are not global because they moved from the West to the East where let's say environmental regulation was not as stringent in the past. These are, are supply chains that have been created from the get-go globally. And it's not just about moving things around, but it's also about moving things around that eventually create products that gl are globally promoted as desirable and in which different countries are now contributing either in tech or in the uh, the um, or in tech or in know how as to how to make them global and commercial to create the the mass scale. 
of them. So this is what I think is truly interesting. So yes, the I2U2 is geopolitical, but you know, all the parties here are playing a role in this new uh, multipolar world of trying to have influence and sway. Thank you very much, Professor Kalantzikos. Now I'm going to invite uh, Aramar Revy, who is joining us from New Delhi, and we really appreciate it. And uh, Aramar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Apologies, colleagues, for coming in late. Um, just quickly, I mean, I missed a lot of, I think, the very interesting back and forth on this. But, you know, I wanted to open my sort of remarks by focusing on something that is both a reality at the moment, but it's going to become a significant challenge, I would say, over the next uh, decade and a half or two decades. And that is that because of serious challenges on, on you know, on the environmental front, uh, specifically water, uh, you know, most projections show that by the 2050s, uh, if we are not able to deal with the global water crisis, and it's not only the local crisis or the regional crisis that we've seen, uh, there may be up to half a billion people who are highly food insecure. In fact, you know, some of them may actually be on 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 sort of on the borderline of of of, of starvation in some senses. And and the reason for that is fairly simple. It's because the climate situation is going to become much worse than it than it currently is. So, you know, this is something that I think we have to take into account very clearly. The Holocene is over. We're in the Anthropocene now. And a return to sort of most Holocene systems in which agriculture has been a very, very critical part, irrespective of which geographies we're talking about, is not about to happen very easily. And we can see that in shifts around the monsoon, which connects, uh, you know, the Asian landmass with Africa, certainly very critical to to India and 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 to, and to China. So I think, as a framing element, I would say we have to look at questions of food security and all the achievements that we've made. I mean, it's actually remarkable in some senses, uh, going on from the fifties and the sixties and in in large countries like India and China that we now have you know what almost one and a half billion people in in both countries in South Asia actually we have a, almost two two billion. Uh, we do have some degree, or in China's case, I guess more significantly so. Uh, some degree of, of food self-sufficiency. That's actually a remarkable achievement. But the fact is that that's not going to remain consistent for a long time. So I think the first thing I want to put on the table is we will not survive uh, not only in these geographies, but in other geographies without, without a, a stable trade system. Because food trade is going to be absolutely essential to main, make sure that not only uh, you know our population is actually fed and nourished, but regime change doesn't happen. As we know, for 150 years or, or, or more, food price um, sort of spikes are one of the most significant challenges that regimes across the world have dealt with. And this is not a new question. You know what happened uh, at the turn of the 90s uh, with the Soviet Union, et cetera. There were a whole range of issues on that. So that's the first thing you know, I, I sort of lay out, that the imperative is, is, is very significant. Um, you know, it, it, it is quite remarkable in some senses that large countries um, in many parts of the world have actually been able to achieve this partially because of technology, green revolution, this, that, the other. Um, so that's the first point. The second thing, of course, is we're also urbanizing very rapidly, right? And China, more than anybody else, China's had the largest urbanization in history. And the challenge with urbanization is it has many, many advantages is, is that it, 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 it is, you know, cities don't actually produce enough food for themselves. So the, I guess the big existential question is, how do you actually produce uh, enough food for you know hundreds of millions of people in some some cases billions of people when you have a few hundred million people who actually know how to farm who still are part of an older agrarian culture uh, and you know being low and middle middle income uh, countries means the kind of precision agriculture or high tech agriculture that we've seen in other parts of the world is actually not within reach Plus, of course, something that you know is pretty obvious in some senses is with the fossil fuel challenges that we're going to have, you know, we're kind of trying to move towards net zero in the next uh, decade, decade and a half or so. One of the clear impacts is going to be uh, energy for agriculture, which means energy for pumping, energy for irrigation, and of course, feedstock for fertilizers. So basically, as we move out of fossil fuels and fossil water, we'll have to reimagine agriculture in a regime of much higher uh, sort of temperatures. We're at 1.1. We're almost certainly uh, going to you know, see um, a 1.5 overshoot. I kind of 
led that process for the IPCC five years ago. And unfortunately, we're, we're dramatically on track. So having said that, what does it imply in, in, in a particular context? And I'll quickly give you a, you know, a quick sense of, of the kind of issues. These are kind of fairly well known as far as India is concerned. But I won't start on the supply side where we've done a lot of things in some senses. I'll start on the demand side. So in spite of the fact that we have about, you know, we're producing about 330 million tons of food grain, we produce whatever it is, 200 million tons of, of milk. We're very, very significant producers in this over the last two or three decades, et cetera, because of a whole range of institutional changes and, you know, regime shifts in some some senses. We still have, um, we still have a large number of people, um, I would say, you know, 200 million plus people who are undernourished. The challenge is you may have gross supply that adds up and you divide it by the number of people in the country, uh, which seems to be adequate. But um, undernourishment is a serious challenge, and we have not been able to solve that problem in India significantly. It's so deep that, you know, even at the current point of time, a third of our, of our children are, are underweight, are stunted, etc. So you could have, uh, in gross terms, enough food, of, and we can come, come to the quality of that food, of course, uh, but that does not necessarily mean, especially as we move to market-based processes and market-based systems, we move away from traditional systems of agriculture. Um, you, so that, that, I think, is a core question. Can we really end hunger? And, of course, uh, you know, if you're able to end, end hunger in some senses, India has a regime. Uh, we have an, a National Food Security Act, which for the last few years has been providing food uh, subsidized or free to almost uh, you know six seven hundred million people, uh, this is post COVID. But having said that, nourishment is a more critical thing, and there we have an interesting challenge, and that is uh, in our context at least uh, because of the green revolution and the shift in cropping types, we now have a new dual burden challenge that's coming out from the health side, uh, partially because of the choice of crops that we have. Uh, so the highly productive crops of including wheat and rice are significantly responsible for the obesity and the challenges that we're facing just now um, in terms of, you know, diabetes. We have a diabetes kind of an explosion, uh, I would say almost an epidemic that's building out in the country. So in a sense, unintended consequences of a whole set of positive actions in some senses, but they need to be dealt with quite clearly. So the core question that we are faced with at the moment, and this is a hard one, uh, this comes up in the climate debate again and again, is that in order to actually have not just food security, but to have uh, nutrition security and equity in some senses, it's very important for us to start thinking about shifting diets. Uh, in India, of course, the debate now, because of the 350 or 330 million tons of people, only about 50 million is, is in millets, is how do you actually expand uh, or change the crop mix to not only be climate sensitive or uh, to be you know able to deal with the vagaries of too much water, too little water, et cetera, but also have a dramatic impact on human health um, and on ecosystem health at the same time. And that I think is a, is, a, is a pretty important question because we are not organized to deal with this as yet. Uh, the markets are not incentivized to deliver this, uh, nor are of course the food trade systems uh, across the world. So you, we may be in a relatively good position at the current point of time, but as we look forward, I think there are some very dramatic shifts. And I think the interesting question for us is, you could do something on the supply side, but on the demand side, shifting patterns of human behavior and cultural choice, as far as food is concerned, is a very, very tough job. And I think that would be one of the most interesting questions for us from the climate point of view. You know, almost um, a quarter to a third of emissions could actually shift if there were dietary shifts that actually happened at the same point in time. So the question is, how can you enable that? So I think the demand side issues are quite important. They're not really focused on in the debate on food security, uh, but they inevitable, they're inevitable both for human health and ecosystem health, and of course, for climate considerations. And from the supply side, of course, we know what the core challenges are like, but I think something which I do want to highlight, and that is that we're going to see a very dramatic uh, challenge in the next um, two or three decades as um, in the climate shifts, uh, when the demand for carbon capture is going to become quite significant. So we cannot avoid a 1.5 overshoot maybe, but if we have to hold the world at two degrees or below, we have to capture carbon. And you know the only technologies or systems that we know how to capture carbon at the moment are to plant. And the question then is, where are you going to plant and what are you going to plant? And effectively, in our geographies, and this is true of much of the tropics, and I would say it could extend into, you know, uh, into the higher latitudes,
Um, if we have to plant and, you know, we go from uh, projects of, of planting a trillion trees to two trillion trees or whatever it is, if we have to plant at that scale, it means conflict as far as land and water and, of course, food security is concerned. This is an emergent challenge and primarily because of the strong market dynamics uh, as we shift uh, from fossil fuels to other kind of biofuels and, and carbon capture. And you can see this coming, you know, with, let's say, the European Union now shifting its focus onto, onto carbon taxes, etc. There's going to be a strong push to try and deal with land-based afforestation, reforestation, etc. So I think this is a very important question that we have to deal with. Uh, and of course, maybe the larger countries will be able to deal with this question, but maybe some of the smaller countries will be seriously challenged to kind of deal with that. And then, at least in the Indian context, our fundamental challenge is that the bulk of our production, the bulk of our land holdings, two-thirds of our people still live in rural areas, uh, are in small holdings. Uh, and these are effectively in serious economic crisis at the current point of time. They're not economically effective. Uh, people don't want to farm, but there's an entire generation of a few hundred million people who have no other choices as far as that's concerned. The question then is, how does one manage, you know, situations where people have uh, an average life expectancy and now touching of 70 or 80, who are the only thing that they can do in some senses uh, is certainly not join an industrial workforce, is to work on the farm, whether in diversified or sort of, you know, other kinds of activities as far as that concerns. So there's a core livelihood question, which is tied to the question of food security. And I think the political economy of, of countries like India are deeply connected with that. With land ownership, with the question of access uh, to resources, and of course, management of uh, land and, 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 and water resources. So I think, you know, having said that, both supply and demand questions have to be taken into account given this dramatically changing environment. Uh, the Holocene is not about to come back to us very easily. Certainly, I would say for much of the century, it may even last longer than that. So the question for us is what kind of policy measures, what kind of processes and what kind of solidarity can we build so that the areas that we know that are going to be food insecure should be producing crops for exports, which is happening in many parts of Africa, in some parts of India for internal movement of, of food. So we have to be, I think, fairly sharp on this question. We have clearly crossed the blue water boundary. In science article from about a couple of weeks ago talks about the green water boundary being reached, which basically means that uh, precipitation across the world is going to shift. And as we know, that's what drives a lot of agriculture uh, that's not irrigated in many parts of the world. So having said that, I think there are, there are tremendous opportunities for dialogue and cooperation. Uh, there should. This is a space in which I would say competition has limited value because of the existential threat that it poses to both to national populations and, of course, to people who are in areas where it's no longer possible or will be no longer possible to produce enough food uh, with the kind of resources that they have at, at the current point of time. So, uh, as we can see from Ukraine, uh, you know, we have large producers like India, China, the US, etc., or even Russia producing uh, uh, food. Uh, just a small constraint in supply from a surplus producer like Ukraine can lead to very significant consequences in, in, in many other parts of the world. So I think we need to really, this is an opportunity for solidarity and working together. Uh, the, the international system is not very friendly at the current point of time, but I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this will lead to a wider dialogue on what security means inside countries and, of course, between countries, because that count is going to shift. So I'll stop there, Mark. I hope I haven't overrun my time. Not at all, Professor Revy. Thank you very much. Um, and those were just wonderful remarks, especially the, the the point about the demand side, which I don't think we had covered uh, in quite as much depth um, as, as you did. And I think the demand side questions apply outside of India, of course, too. Um, so I'm going to turn and to a question from uh, one of the audience members, and, and while it's uh, directed uh, to to two of you, I'm going to expand it out to to have all three of you um, address uh, parts of, of the two questions that I'll pose. And thank you, Karen Ju, for for posing these questions. Um, and so the first one is, what distinguishes food security from other forms of non-traditional security issues that confront China's international engagement, but I'll modify that to say 
India's international engagement, as well as maybe UAE or Gulf states or Middle East uh, for, for Professor Kalansakas, does that inform a different approach to China's uh, engagement, China's or India's or Gulf states engagement with the global South? Okay, so that's the first question. And then the second is, is somewhat related. Um, in your opinion, to what extent does uh, China's, India's, Gulf states approach to food security illustrate, well, in this case, it would just be China. So in your opinion, to what extent does China's approach to food security illustrate recalibration of or shifting aspiration for the Belt and Road Initiative? Do the key policy drivers come from China or from other countries and regions? Uh, so, so that could be, that could be to all three of you, of course, because you, you all three follow uh, China, not just Professor Jia. So, parts or, or all of those questions, and and since uh, Professor Revy just spoke, I'll, I'll offer Professor Kalansikos or Professor Jia the first cut at those questions. I'll I'll ask Professor Jia to go first because I. I want to see what how he's going to reimagine sure. the difference of food sec uh, food security versus other issues of security. I'm actually thinking about this question now. Hmm. You're asking me to give a long, long lecture. <laughs> actually, uh, uh, security. This is not a matter of a difference for the sake of a difference. Security in the Chinese language or Chinese, should we you say? Uh, understanding of the kind of social contract does not always involve military is actually adequacy is security and then the Chinese vocabulary is not just Chinese very much Asian if you look at Japanese or Southeast Asian non-traditional security basically means uh, those issues that are important require attention but you don't um, think of military option as the first or ultimate solution. It's quite different. There is a you know, nuance here. I would, it's not really a nuance. It's not a non-traditional source of threat to national security. You know, what I just said is very much in the English language literature in the transatlantic academic fields. So a short answer to that question posed is that it doesn't really differ much because non-traditional security, as is understood in the Chinese and with, should we say North East, East Asian context, is a food. And food is another non-traditional security period. But they are not in the sense, right, in the transatlantic academic sense or policy think tank sense, uh, I'm saying that's a non-traditional source of threat to who's ever national security. Now the BRI, um, it's, we're just, in a few days, we're going to, two weeks, we're going to have the third BRI summit in Beijing. A lot can be said. Um, again, that can be a long, long, long lecture, but I think one of the uh, disjoints in Chinese projection or uh, Western understanding, uh, outside of China understanding in that, Really, it's a meant to be an open-ended invitation on the table. Right after I go back to Beijing, I will be uh, hosting a uh, conversation uh, about how some of the Chinese language uh, initiatives ought to be translated in English. The notion of initiative in Chinese is not uh, does not really align that well with what's normally expected of an initiative in the English language. Let me stop here. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I think a couple of things. The first thing is, I think there are no, different notions of security. There's national security issues. And I agree that um, whenever we tend to think of security in terms of military terms, um, or I guess in global politics, in terms of alliance, uh, terms which are all of the, all of this terminology I definitely agree is much more um, how would I say it aggressive almost um, and has become increasingly weaponized so uh food if if food food security is both a national concern and a regional concern and a global concern and I think I agree that it 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 is part of the the bigger the wider basket 
of, of issues that are not military issues. But the way that we're thinking about food security, I think, really will, again, it's the, what are we asking to solve for? What is the actual problem that we're trying to address? I always say we have to decide what it is that we're trying to achieve before we start with all uh, the policy solutions. So if is food an industrial plan? Is the, Are we moving into there is not enough food, we will have food scarcity, therefore we need a global or regional or local but industrial infrastructure style plan that will make uh, the solutions possible? These are questions that we need to ask and I think Professor Revy touched upon so many different issues. First, that this is not, that there are various, uh, different countries have different issues at hand. A lot of the problems overlap but there are some issues that are particularly different. And he did mention uh, two issues I touched upon this, which were the dietary issues. And so for example, one of the solutions that we're examining now, which is a, an industrial tech approach to food production, is really, is that going to improve our diets or is it going to make it more impoverished because we're going to have to be able to produce crops that can be, cultivated, let's say, in vertical farms. Uh, what is it, again, that we're trying to, to solve? Uh, the uh, questions of uh, dietary shifts, ecosystem health, that is another issue. And, and the more important issue that I think we haven't touched upon, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of diverging a little here, is what is food? What is it that we're trying to actually secure? Are we trying to say that we're securing wheat and rice and junk food? I, I don't know exactly what it is, again, that we're trying to solve for. Because we talk about food and all of us in our mind's eye think of the farmers in different parts of the world who are struggling you know, to uh, either their subsistence farmers and they're struggling because of the ups and downs of, of pricing or accessibility to markets. But there is, you know, these farms may exist in certain parts of the world, but in so many parts of the world, they're not there anymore. There's a, they've been replaced with major farms with industrial production models. And so, and also what are we producing all of these inputs for? It's not for our family dinner uh, around the table where someone's cooked a nutritious meal, whether it's, you know, it depends, uh, irrespective of how rich or poor somebody is, the, all by way of saying, you know, producing inputs, the, the ingredients, not inputs, I hate that word actually, ingredients to produce a, a nutritious meal as best a family can? Or are we talking about all of this other food that's presented as food across our economies and our cultures? So I will stop there. Okay, uh, Professor Revy, did you want to... to add uh, further thoughts. We have quite a number of questions that I can move on to if otherwise. I, I'll be very brief here. And that is that the boundary conditions have shifted. That's what I was trying to do. So it's not only that, you know, temperatures will be higher, but you just will not have enough water in some places. So the challenge for us is you can do industrial agriculture at maybe 5,000, 10,000, $15,000 per capita. But then large parts of the world which are sitting at five hundred or a thousand dollars per capita, so the, and you know, and and it's not just a hundred million, hundred there are billions of people at that at that level. So the question then is: first, can they feed themselves? Can the countries in which they are significant populations feed themselves? And then after that, uh, what does that mean for for you know international relations and trade? Uh, that's I think the, the the larger question that we need to deal with because uh, the boundary conditions are going to shift very dramatically non-linearly, um, and basically it's going to be a challenge to deal with water. Like I said, no fossil fuel, no fossil water. Uh, they, they will not be available to many of these large populations in under 20 years time. Um, so industrial processes are not going to be able to cope with that kind of process because you don't have the capital investment. And if you don't have the culture of, of, of growing uh, in some senses, then you're in deep trouble because that's what's holding agrarian populations together. I mean, there's a lot of distress there's a huge range of crisis in, in many agrarian cultures across the world. But at least the culture of growing is there because that's that's a very sophisticated culture. 
dealing with uncertainty, uh, dealing with uh, you know a whole range of uh, overshoots and other processes about the concern. So I'll stop there, Mark. Okay, thank you. I'm going to combine two questions from audience members. Um, one is from Merle Shulkin, who's asking about what is the role for uh, and public support for stockholding, which is uh, i.e. public buffer stocks or subsidies for private stockholding. So what is the role for stockholding in national and international efforts to stabilize stable, uh, staple food prices in the face of insecurity? Um, uh, related to that, Isabella Weber, uh, asking a question about how do you see the interaction between food security, global instabilities, and inflation? Um, in the case of China, are there lessons to be learned uh, from China's food price stabilization system? Um, so a, a general question, uh, Merle asks a second follow-up related to about just general uh, um, efforts to liberalize agricultural markets. Are we seeing a relationship between state and nation? So the the whole um, effort in the past to liberalize trade in agricultural goods, um, is that being abandoned uh, in favor of kind of state-directed uh, solutions related to this question of food security? So Mark, maybe I'll come in here with a contrarian example. So India is the largest milk producer in the world. And the reason that's, that's happened is because our milk is largely produced by cooperatives. So this is not mm. the traditional framework where you're saying you're going to go to large private sector investment. Uh, and the cooperative sector is very successfully, not only in the milk sector, but in oil seeds, where India has a lot of volatility, there's a fair amount of trade, import, et cetera, has actually used buffer stocks. But these are buffer stocks that are not necessarily driven by you know national corporations or nationalized corporations, but the cooperative sector. And this has been done at scale. So We've actually managed quite successfully to deal with volatility in uh, oil, oil, you know, oil and oil seed markets, certainly for milk markets, by using a fundamental different uh, sort of frame of movement, uh, which connects the producer and the consumer in a more interesting way. So I'm just saying it's contrarian. That's not the the ordinary way that the large agribusinesses would go. Uh, the way that agricultural markets are being pushed to be opened up in some cases, uh, in spite of massive subsidies that we see. Uh, certainly in Europe and in the US for, for agriculture. Uh, so I'd like to, to, to say a few words about the food price stabilization policies. Now we've seen, I can speak about two countries right off the bat. Both the UAE has created a, a basket of certain uh, uh, foods for which prices need to remain constant and you know the government needs to be notified. In Greece, the government created a market pass, which was again, uh, identifying certain products in the supermarket that were the main, the staples for any household. Uh, and, and those prices needed to be as stable as possible. And still inflation, I think, has really been persistent. And there have been, often uh, increases that are not warranted. So the government is trying to be, oversee this kind of uh, uh, increase in prices. Now, I want to also point that, you know, all these government projects are really in countries, especially let's say in Europe or elsewhere, these are the taxpayers are contributing taxpayer money in order to stabilize prices. So. We think the government is stepping in, but in fact, we're stepping in to stop the increases of prices that we're paying. So the so the question is, you know, I think we need to have a much more robust system. Many times, that, that's not to say that there hasn't been a supply chain disruption or there haven't been uh, catastrophes. Greece just went twice through an incredible flood in one of the most fertile areas in central Greece that are, you know, it's wheat and cotton and other other things completely destroyed and inundated. It's a 1.5 billion catastrophe. Now, and, and there's fear that the prices will uh, increase, but I think that a lot of times it's also been, it's, it's also a technique to increase the cost of, of products. So I definitely think we need to have oversight and we need to remember that the people stabilizing it are taxpayers, again. Uh, 
I will answer in the question uh, in the order that was asked. Stock holding, whether it's private investment or public investment, is actually tricky as a financial matter and also in terms of uh, preventing against food waste. When you hold too much or too long, the, you know, the quality of nutrition therein can be a problematic. Now, there should be more international cooperation, but uh, you know that involves confidence in sharing data. It also involves coordination in uh, terms of joint release when in, in, to dampen speculation or to deal with sudden spikes of price rise. But much easier said than done. Um, if you look at the oil stock holding uh, as a crude oil stock or refined oil, we're not really there yet. And uh, the uh, that does mean the international political economy study needs to pay some attention to that and carry forward the discussion. Now, uh, China's uh, food stabilization, it comes at a huge cost, especially on the consumption side. And if you look at uh, uh, China's food price uh, in terms of reaching to the low incomes, uh, we have done across the board a fairly good job, but I'm not so sure the conclusion is all that rosy. If you look at Guangdong, it's probably one of the few provinces that does not systematically subsidize anyone, but Guangdong is where across the country, the uh, food prices are compared to the lows in the rest of the region of the country, and also there's never been any short of food because the market allocation. So China is still on the wheel, uh, experimenting with that, how you balance you know, the assurance of income for farmers and then uh, cost. Um, so in that sense, transitioning from what you can call government plan to not central plan to a fully liberalized market. It's, you know, hybrids somewhere. I don't think there are positive lessons to learn, but I don't think uh, we have found so called the magic key yet. The last point about the li a liberalized food growth, trade and production regime, that remains to be a valid topic of the discussion. Uh, so far in China, majority of the Farming is still done at the smallholder farm. Although with the rapid demographic change, we may have more commercialized farming um, taking over. But then, um, uh, how that evolves, uh, we need to. That remains to be seen. But here it goes back to the point, Sophia and especially Sophia mentioned, that's the supply chains, that's the confidence or the competition or the worries about choke points. Uh, the worst, I would say, I would say worst, and that marriage scenario is that as part of the global, the uh, you know, worries about world order or competition, including what Mark outlined at the beginning of today's discussion, that somehow China invests so much both in policy and in financial resources to be more independent. You know, to you know, or you would say uh, create a high fence against um, foreign interac interaction with the rest of the world. I don't think that would be self-sustainable. Uh, there are other examples I we don't have time to mention. You know, other economies tried that, but in the end, that will not be successful. But where do you find that? sort of sweet point among big powers that's very relevant, including, you know, I didn't mention the word how climate technology and, uh, you know, food preferences, food culture, consumption culture factor in, it's just a uh, very rich field for study. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ja. Thank you, Professor Kalansikos. Thank you, Professor Revy. I think Professor Ja's remarks are a wonderful way to wrap things up. It was a very wide ranging discussion clearly a lot of areas uh, that we, we did not cover and a lot of areas that uh, maybe people in the audience who are thinking of their future research topics uh, can, can pursue. Uh, I was really delighted to hear that uh, one of your students uh, was able to, to join us today, Professor Jaw. Um, 
And I will say to the rest of you, thank you for coming. And we hope to see you at our next uh, panel, uh, which you can find information about, as I said, on the India China Institute website. Thanks again, and we'll see you next month.